The Eternal by Bobby Asgar Chapter 1 Sheets, Lights, and Lullabies The Christmas break of 1989 marked Lisa's first away from home. The pub, a brimming student haunt, was the seventh of the night. The swans are swimming to her twelve days of Christmas pub crawl list. The mammoth undertaking had but two stipulations. First, all participants were required to sing the corresponding verse of the cumulative song upon arrival at each consecutive pub. Second, they had to knock back a bare minimum of one drink in each of them. Seven pubs in, singing in synchrony was proving problematic at best for all and sundry, much less remembering the gift names in their sequence. But that was the point, and there were five more pubs to go. The pub annexing the street may well have been par for the course on a Saturday night, but it was bitterly cold out on the stoop, the ice-stinging, foot-stomping kind. Lisa wasn't alone in doing as much. She folded her arms tight to bar the chill. Dave stepped down ahead of her. Lisa held back and took note. He had chocolate plates for eyes, ruffled medium-length brown hair, an infectious smile, that and a tight butt. She hadn't joined him out on the stoop for his conversation alone. The truth was, she had liked him from the moment she first set eyes on him, all the fifteen minutes earlier. Dave turned about and looked up at Lisa. In black thigh-high boots and a short dress under a shorter coat, she was showing some upper leg skin, potentially flaunting it. She definitely had the pegs for it. A tight bod, too, and the skirt would make for easy access. Back in the pub, she could hardly hear him. Moreover, her friends were all about. Twelve minutes and thirty-seven seconds after first stepping up to her, he had checked his watch. She was following him to the door. Lisa shuddered, said it was cold out. Her speech was slurred. Dave smiled impishly, told her not to worry, that it would help keep her warm. Lisa smiled bashfully at him. Dave stimmed his shivering. The girl wasn't wrong. It was brass monkey weather. But he wasn't going to let her know he thought that. A couple staggered up onto the stoop. The man was half cut. His girlfriend, three quarters, at least. They were arm in arm, more for support than affection. On their way to the pub door, the girl accidentally bumped into Lisa's right side. Lisa frowned resentfully at the woman. Dave liked the look. Her blue eyes were glazed but glowing. The fire in them made her seem wicked. The bar had been too loud for Dave's liking. Had far too many faces, familiar and otherwise. The problem was, the street outside it wasn't much better. He knew she liked him. She had stepped out, after all. To better his chances, he needed to get her down off the stoop and moving. Warming up and away from the other punters. Arms out and basking in the frigid air, he made out it wasn't so bad, and he told her as much. Still moderately peeved by the clumsy people, Lisa barely looked at him. Dave saw she was shivering again. The clanging brass nuts were tipping the scales. If he didn't act quickly, she would be back inside and with her friends. He who dares, Rodney. Dave quickly climbed up onto the stoop. Knowing the brash move could go either way, he went all in, and he kissed her. Lisa's first instinct was to recoil, but she didn't. More than mild inebriation had her compromised. Before she knew it, she was relishing the moment. Dave slowly pulled away from her lips. Lisa's cheeks were flushed, her eyes were euphoric. To Dave, both were clear signs she was eager for more. The ice wasn't so much broken as it had been hit by a tropical heat wave. Dave smiled warmly. Bashful, Lisa smiled back at him. Dave took hold of her hand and said, Come on. She didn't verbally agree, but she didn't resist him either. He led her down off the stoop, then across the road and away from the punters. For a girl from a broken home, but for being impressionable, Lisa was fairly grounded. Her mother, not so much. 
she too had come from a broken home. It had left her all manner of adjectives. Headstrong, impetuous, volatile, fragile, and insecure, to name but a few. As balanced as a buckled wheel. Her father, on the other hand, was a horse of a different colour. Quite literally. His parents had emigrated from Pakistan. They had wanted their children to be born in the best country in the world. The British establishment had a lot to answer for. Father was caring, considerate, and gentle. If anything, too much so. Mother, again, not so much. Their incompatibility made divorce inevitable. Temperaments in mind, father had about as much chance of coming out of it unscathed as a cross-eyed veterinarian giving a feral tomcat a rectal examination. Lisa was four years old when the breakup started. It was rough. Spanned two years. Still, switching between parents every Friday afternoon thereafter was probably better than life beneath storm clouds. A product of her parents and upbringing, she could have easily acquired a fair share of the bad. She hadn't. She was a daddy's girl through and through. The kind that would say poo and pee-pee rather than use even mildly offensive language in his presence. On the TV, in an American accent, duty, sounding like duty, still turned dramatic scenes into skits. The more rugged the role, the funnier she and her father found it. Father wasn't a prude. He wasn't a stickler who frowned upon swearing. He swore, just not often, not superfluously. He believed that for all things, including words, there was a proper usage. That or his moderation was an effort to counter mother's own excess. Moreover, in his eyes, his daughter was the epitome of an absolute angel. Lisa loved watching movies with him. She so loved seeing and hearing him laugh, especially after all he'd been through. For the longest time, she had wondered if she would ever see him smile again. Adding insult to injury, not long after the breakup, he very nearly lost both her and his sanity, and through no fault of his own. Lisa had only recently discovered that her prepubescent exuberance, curiosity, and self-exploration was noted by mother and then twisted to put father in a less than morally sanitary light. Child protection services were involved. Although no formal accusations were made, the potential threat was deemed sufficient to warrant action. Father didn't have a choice. If he disagreed in any way, further legal action would ensue. The illusions alone were enough to scar him deeply. It explained his physically distancing himself from her for the three years thereafter, from a loving and doting father to being scared to be seen so much as touching her. He wasn't even allowed to be alone with her, not just in the room, but in the house. The CPS insisted that when mother went out, shopping for example, another party had to be present. No relatives lived nearby, and friends weren't always available. More often than not, it was a neighbour, someone they barely knew placed with a young girl. Father couldn't always be in the same room for hours on end. When he was elsewhere in the house, the third party, man or woman, and young Lisa were alone and in private. The CPS were okay with that. Stranger danger didn't seem to be an issue, rather a preference. Still, one way or another, time cured all. And even the most level-headed 18-year-olds had a little bipolar in them. Now a tipsy, carefree student in Manchester, Lisa was a million miles away from her past. Down here, Dave said. The canal bank was steep, muddy. Worse, it stretched into darkness. Lisa wasn't so sure. Dave saw she was ill at ease. We can go back. No. Lisa liked him. At least she thought she did, and she didn't want to ruin it. But not too far. She meant it in both ways. There wasn't another soul to be seen on the towpath. Though at the very heart of a concrete jungle, the setting was far removed. The diminished light only amplified its feel. The air was dense and musty, that of a forest floor damp with autumn dew. The canal was dead calm, darkest onyx streaked with reflected light. Leafless trees stood gaunt on either bank. The skeletal digits were reaching out, as if to claw at the abounding darkness. A low bridge spanned the water just ahead. 
Lisa had crossed it a thousand times, but she had never once thought of seeing what lay beneath it. Now that she had, she wished she hadn't, or that it was daytime at least. The black vacuum broke the towpath in two and turned the ambient feel from romance after dark to the scene of a slasher flick. Lisa was on the verge of bailing. Dave took her hand. It's okay, he said. Lisa didn't speak, just stared into the heart of darkness. You scared? Dave said. Lisa shook her head and said, N -n No. The light was transparent. Don't be. It's just dark is all. It wasn't the darkness that scared Lisa. More that which might be hidden and waiting within it. You do know there's no such thing as a bogeyman, Dave said, and he pulled her closer. Trust me. He looked into her eyes and gently squeezed her hands. There's nothing there. Lisa felt foolish. She remembered how her father would always make sure the nightlight was on in a bedroom. He did so out of compassion, and for good reason. Children slept more soundly absent darkness to birth demons. He would take the effort to angle the light perfectly so it wouldn't disturb her. When she was frightened, he would stroke her hair and sing her to sleep. Reminded of how she used to hide under the bedsheet or protect her neck with it, she cracked a sheepish grin, as if a piece of cloth would stop a monster or a vampire. Burying one's head in the sand was so childish. She could still hear music and laughter. The pub wasn't far, just up the bank and across the road. There had to have been close to forty punters outside it. There were more people up ahead on the bridge. She was in the middle of Manchester, surrounded by pubs, clubs and masses of people. What could possibly go wrong? Lisa passed into the shade beneath the bridge. Her eyes adjusted. The path was dim, but clear. Dave was right. It's just dark is all. His back to the wall, Dave drew Lisa in. He held her close and looked into her eyes. Lisa could smell the heat rise off him. Dave told her he had liked her from the moment he first saw her, on the second day of Christmas, with two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. He said he had wanted to steal her away from her friends all night to take her elsewhere, somewhere quiet and secluded, where they could be alone with one another. Lisa shivered, but not from the cold. Though the air about her was bitterly crisp, she was flushed and warm. Far removed from the surreptitious feel of an alleyway or the back of the bicycle sheds, the void beneath a bridge was a world hidden in the midst of another. Dark, musty, secluded, and with an atmosphere so thick and intense that even the blaring music softened to it. Any lingering fears she had were instantly evanescent. The rest of the world quickly faded further away. Then she leaned forward and kissed him. Dave reciprocated, passionately, but restricted his hands to her hips and waist. To Lisa, it was a good thing, albeit a torturous tease. When his hands finally did roam free, it felt so right and so wrong at the same time that she was powerless to stop them. She was lost enraptured by both him and the moment. Dave's hands ventured further, explored mountains and valleys. Lisa shuddered, though she liked the feel of his passion. In the depths of her inebriated mind, her morality was on the verge of raging in civil conflict. Then his hand went a valley too far. It was more than Lisa had bargained for. Her conscience broke free of its shackles and breached. She pulled back breathlessly. What's wrong? Dave said sympathetically. That he was considerate rather than slighted made Lisa feel foolish for a second time. Her insecurity blossomed. Stammering and in simplistic terms, she told him it was too much too soon. Dave feigned innocence. Then he pulled a slightly wounded expression and softly said he was sorry. His compassion fueled Lisa's self-loathing. First a scared child, now an old maid. Brimful of insecurity, she berated herself inwardly. If she wanted him to hate her, she was going about it the right way. She reciprocated the apology, but by a magnitude of five to ten. Taking the blame might have helped more if she hadn't followed it with Victorian morality. Restating her justification for abruptly breaking passion's flow resulted in him asking her if she wanted to go back to the pub. No sooner had the words left his lips than she told him that she didn't. At least... She didn't think she wanted to go back to the pub. 
We'll just take it slow, Lisa said. Slow. Dave smiled sympathetically and subtly nodded his head. Inwardly, he weighed up his chances and his options. The thing was, he didn't do low or middle gears, nor was he the type to rely on luck or chance. He preferred baited fishing to board games. A guaranteed outcome extended the thrill of the catch. There were those that could listen to football or even cricket on the radio. Then there was Dave. 90 minutes plus extra time just to hear about a goal was the worst kind of tease. Seeing the strike and then the ball blast through and hit the back of the net was a far sight better. But it was still voyeurism. He needed to feel it going. Nothing could beat physically playing the game. He didn't want to get to know the girl, at least not in a platonic sense. What did she think? That they would sit on the canal bank and count the stars? Not that there ever were any above Manchester. Or skip stones across the canal? She knew what she was signing up for from the moment she consented to stepping out of the pub with him. She had made him work for it, too. He had nearly lost out to her friends, then her blatant insecurity, then the frigid cold. All three had been close calls. But when they kissed, he knew he was in. Climbing down the canal bank, holding hands in the dark, stepping under the bridge, and not a soul about. She wanted it just as much as he did. That she still had her arms around his neck hard forged the fact. Playing hard to get, he had seen it often enough. A tease, part of the game. Hers was self-deceit, placating her conscience so she wouldn't think herself such a slut after the fact. But how she thought of it afterwards wasn't his concern. Dangling the bait a little longer wasn't beyond him, just so long as the ends justified the effort. She would have to be quick, mind, and not just because she would soon be sobering up. Back in the pub, there was a certain little blonde he wanted to tap off with and save for a rainy day. If this one decided to draw it out, or took to changing her mind, he would just have to be a little more persuasive. Dave faked a compassionate smile and said, Slow then. Lisa smiled, chivalrous to boot. She pulled closer, and then she kissed him. With passion's rise, his left hand was under her coat, exploring the small of her back. The right cupped her head, stroked her hair, then gripped it tight. Before she knew it, he was clawing the bare skin beneath her blouse, and she was shuddering. Sensitized, flushed, breathless, she was dizzy and adrift. His lips traced a path across her cheek. She tilted her head back and opened up to his vampire kiss. Jesus Christ, a man said, looking down from the bridge of the canal. Lisa barely registered the sound, much less took note of the underlying shock in his tone. At first, Dave paid the voice little heed. His focus was on the girl's neck and shoulder. Considering the late hour and locale, noise was nothing untoward. Even so, there was a certain quality to the cry that set alarm bells ringing. He glanced at the canal and did a double take. There was something in the black water. It was half submerged and moving nearer. Dark as it was, he couldn't make the shape out. Dave stopped mauling. He froze rigid. Lisa opened her eyes. Her euphoria quickly faded. Then she was simply puzzled. Dave? Lisa said. Dave didn't reply. Lisa pulled back to look at him. What, what's wrong? she said. Dave's eyes stretched wide with horror. Jesus Christ! Lisa jolted. Then she froze. Whatever he was looking at was directly behind her. Her breath locked tight in her lungs, Lisa's terror spiked. She didn't want to know what it was. There was a certain salvation in denial. But the sugar pill was fleeting. The urge to look, long since beyond overwhelming, drew her like a needle to the north. And as she turned her head about, there wasn't time for all eighteen years of her life to flash before her eyes. For want of a bedsheet, she felt utterly naked and vulnerable. Without a nightlight, her worst fears clawed the way out of the shadows and strained to reach her. How she wished her father would stroke her hair and sing her a lullaby, but he was absent too. Then she saw what it was, and she screamed. 